So I would ask uh, uh, our good friend Ahmed Abel Latif to join me in the stage. Uh, Ahmed is a senior program manager at the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development, and he is as well a research fellow at Kennedy uh, School of Government at Harvard. So, Ahmed, please. Thank you. Um, Egyptian standards are fully aligned with Brazilian standards if not higher in that area. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak uh, um, um, for, for not very long about, uh, and I don't have a presentation, so, so just I'm going to speak very uh, spontaneously about uh, when I, what I think was one of the successful mobilizations, looking at the current moment, at the current landscape uh, in 2012 that I was involved in, which is called uh, the Pan-African Intellectual Property Organization. I think some of you are aware about it. Uh, it's been posted widely on, on different lists. And uh, I'll just give you a, a, a very, very short background about uh, what, why, why was there mobilization on this issue and what happened and what lessons could we draw. So, uh, in November 2006, a ministerial meeting of African Ministers for Science and Technology meets in Cairo and adopts a recommendation to create a Pan-African Intellectual Property Organization. Right? Uh, so, Immediately, I was working at the time in the government in Egypt, and I, I'm kind of surprised by this recommendation because uh, African countries have different legal regimes in terms of intellectual property. You have basically three groups of countries uh, in Africa. You have the French-speaking countries under OAPI, l'Organisation Africaine de la Propriété Intellectuelle. You have the English-speaking uh, countries under ARIPO and other regional uh, organizations, organization uh, for, for, for English-speaking countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And then you have uh, the countries of Northern Africa, Egypt, uh, uh, Tunisia, uh, uh, Morocco, Algeria, and also South Africa that are not member of any of these two regional organizations. So you have three different group of countries. And I think as it has been really uh, mentioned by Gola uh, there has been a, a, a well-known criticism to OAPI and ARIPO in terms of the extent to which these two regional organizations integrate public policy related flexibilities, particularly in the area of public health, but also in the areas of plant varieties, that the instruments that these organizations have adopted really go beyond the TRIPS requirements, right? While at the same time, countries like Egypt and South Africa uh, uh, have been more pushing towards a more kind of balanced view of intellectual property on the international level. Anyway, I tried to echo some concerns at the time, uh, but the issues goes kind of in a long tunnel of bureaucratic discussions. And fast forward to September 2012, a couple of months ago, uh, Professor Brooke Baker from Northwestern University posts, uh, posts uh, uh, an email on the IP health list saying that the draft statute of PIPO, the Pan-African Intellectual Property Organization, is ready and is ready for adoption in two months' time at the next m uh, conference of African Ministers of Science and Technology. And you have a look at the statute right, of this new single African body on IP. And it is a bit disappointing uh, from the views of, 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 of many of us who have been engaged on IP and development issue in the past 10 years, right? Uh, 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 the draft, uh, well, first, it's very ambitious. It, 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 it would give to this organization to be the single voice that speaks in the name of Africa on all IP issues. It would unify all IP legislation in Africa. And it would administer IP rights in, in, in Africa on a regional basis. Very complex, very challenging, very far-fetched uh, issue to realize. And in particular, this issue of negotiating and speaking the name of Africa uh, at a time where decisions on IP would be made in Addis Abeba, where African countries have no particular IP expertise there. They have no delegates that are specifically dealing with IP there. There's very limited presence of civil society dealing with IP issues. So very problematic. The draft statute itself uh, really uh, uh, does not integrate uh, uh, really in an explicit manner any public interest uh, concerns, perspectives, does not integrate flexibilities, limitations and exceptions, does not mention uh, the African positions that have been taken at the international level, particularly in the context of the World Trade Organization and the World Intellectual Property Organization, where African countries have been pushing for uh, uh, the use of limitations and flexibilities, the African countries, for example, in the context of copyright, have tabled the proposal of an international instrument for limitations and exceptions for libraries, for uh, research institutions and education. So a very big disconnect with also the positions taken by the African countries at the international level. 
Add to this the fact that most African countries are actually least developed countries. And they have an exemption under the TRIPS agreement of implementing its obligation under 2000, until 2013 and 2016 for pharmaceutical patents. So the statute also does not mention, for example, even the simple notion of balanced intellectual property, right? Okay. So what does the statute has? A lot of very ambiguous language on IP and development, right? And the language uh, on IP and development tends to be ambiguous and not very clear because there's really uh, uh, two visions uh, uh, of IP and development. The traditional one that has existed for a very long time, which is called IP for development, the use of IP for development, which is the use of IP as a tool for development. So the more you use intellectual property rights, the more you develop, right? That is the, the traditional view that has been out there for a long time. But I think the view that we have tried to emerge in the past years is what I would call development-oriented IP, right? That for uh, IP really uh, to be used effectively as a tool for development, it also needs to be balanced. It also needs to take into account local circumstances, public policy objectives, etc., etc. So the statute really is more about uh, the issue of IP as a tool for development and not much about development-oriented IP, right? And uh, finally, th th there's some very, really strange and, 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 and technical issues in, in, in the statute that it shows clearly an inclination to right holders organization, right? There's uh, even a, a, a provision that says that uh, uh, the, this new organization should coordinate closely with international bodies working in the area of IP, such as uh, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, the WTO, but mentions, for example, CISAC as one of the international bodies it should closely coordinate with. Why CISAC? Again, not, not very clear. And finally, the way this statute is to be approved is by simple majority decision of African heads of states. This is a bit technical issue, but normally when you create a new international or a regional body or an international agreement, countries should ratify it. There should be a domestic ratification procedure, right? And the domestic ratification procedures give the opportunity to parliaments to have a say. And it is around the domestic ratification procedure that, for example, the ACTA issue was uh, uh, played and, and there was an opportunity for civil society intervention. This is the first time I've seen a regional body would be created with a new international treaty with no national ratification procedure. So simple majority of two-thirds of African heads of states, if they approve it, the organization is created and entered into force. Uh, that is very problematic because, uh, again, it, it turns, in terms of African, how do African heads of states meeting? When African heads of states meet, they have on the first agenda items the war in Congo, you know, uh, in, in Eastern Congo, uh, uh, and they have very uh, kind of pre the, the, the situation in Mali, and then they have at the end of the list of agenda items, maybe number 40, the creation of or, or the adoption of the statute of the Pan-African Intellectual Property Organizations. And on these type of technical issues, they would mostly rely on just the recommendation coming out from the technical ministers. So to cut a long story short, if the, if the meeting of November of Brazzaville had adopted the statute, it would have been approved by the heads of states of the African Union, right? It would have been created. So we're in September, very, stro very short time uh, to, to, to do something about this issue. And um, I, uh, by coincidence, uh, 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 we're meeting in, actually in Washington at American University meeting on limitations and exception. Uh, I meet there uh, a person maybe you're all familiar with called Dick Kayoya from Uganda. He is uh, 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 also uh, uh, has worked with libraries and on, on, also on IP and development issues. And we start exchanging some, some on, on social media some, some, some comments about this, what I've just told you, uh, on actually the LinkedIn, LinkedIn uh, group of open air, uh, the open air network that I think many of you are familiar with. And I thought we have to do something about this. So I said, well, we should uh, maybe, I, I only see, I, I, maybe why don't we do a, a petition, right? To raise awareness around this issue. So we, 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 we then we, he told me I'll contact you off, <laughs> on an email. And then we start to draft a petition uh, on this uh, Pan-African Intellectual Property Organization. And I told him, well, if we get 50 signatures on this in such a short time, it would be great. Uh, and while we're drafting this petition, we're also very uh, fortunate to, to benefit from uh, uh, a number of people who have been working also on African and IP issues uh, that are here. Uh, um, some of them I would like to recognize, Eve Gray, Andrew Renz, uh, Jeremy De Beer, uh, Karin Kube, uh, Suzanne Estrico. If I for forget someone, please apologize. Shidi Umagam. And they also help us to structure the petition in a way that is not just reactive, but it has also some positive messages, right? That it suggests some changes to the statute. 
and ultimately calls for more consultation on it. Anyway, the petition gathers 400 signatures, including by uh, uh, really a lot of NGOs, Oxfam, Médecins Sans Frontières, a lot of academics, a lot of people present here that I'd like to thank. And it becomes a tool of spreading awareness around this issue. It goes viral on different blogs, on tech, their tech, IP Watch relays some blogs on it. And you have really a wide diversity of voices that are emerging from Africa. They're saying, really, maybe this is not the best idea of how this is being done, and we should take more time to reflect on this. We use this uh, uh, petition to mobilize awareness also in governments, because surprisingly, not all governments, agencies in different countries are aware even that this new organization is being created and this statute is being approved. For example, copyright offices in most African countries had no idea. And although the mandate and the scope of this organization would also extend to copyright, right? And uh, the African group in Geneva, which is really has been uh, moving a lot of the proposals on African proposals at the international level, was also not involved in the consultation and the preparation of this issue. And they were also very instrumental in reaching out to them to help raise awareness and to, to convey to their capitals that this has huge implications in terms of what kinds of positions would Africa take on at the international level and which type of approach to intellectual property and access to knowledge it would convey. Anyway, I think all this pays its fruits, uh, brings fruits, uh, uh, and the African meeting that meets in November decides to postpone the adoption of the statute. And it creates a consultative group to reflect further on the statute, right? So the issue is not uh, uh, dead. It is, not, it is still uh, out there. Uh, the, 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 the creation, the decision to create PIPO is established. So this body one day will see the light. But uh, the, the, what it's, the statute should look like uh, is still an open question and, and, and left to further consultation. And what we have been saying, uh, among many others, is that if one lesson we, we have learned in, in all these years and all these debates uh, is that uh, 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 intellectual property has a cross-sectoral impact, so you need a broad range of stakeholders to engage in any issue of IP, and particularly civil society. And uh, we had raised this issue or, or, or had gotten feedback that in the consultative process that uh, the African Union Secretary said it had consulted with IP-relevant organizations. So it gives you an indication that they did not consider civil society as an IP-relevant organization, right? So we hope that this new consultative process or that uh, the new thinking about this at the African Union will have a wide consultation process and, uh, for example, a call for public comments uh, by different African stakeholders and uh, 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 that it would, it would lead to a, to a more diverse set of views uh, being incorporated, right? So I, I would say that this was a kind of a mini, very condensed ACTA process at the African level, but many people were not aware of it, but huge implications, right? That would have had huge implications if it had not been addressed. Uh, and uh, I think, again, uh, very, you know, very, very short lessons I, I, I would point out that uh, many of these processes who take place at the technocratic and bureaucratic level are not easy to, to, to intervene in if there's no occasion of public consultation, if there's no ratification, if there's no uh, kind of, of, of public space for discussion. Uh, the second thing is that governments represent diverse views and not all government agencies are aligned on, 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 on these views and I think there is space there to take advantage of. Uh, I would think that in terms of lessons, the, 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 the lessons I would, I would like to point out is that institutions matter. And a lot of the mobilizations that we have witnessed uh, 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 around the group of people that are here and in past years have been around issues, have been around norms, have been about national laws, have been about international treaties, right, like ACTA or national legislation like SOPA and PIPA. But really, can you uh, uh, really take forward the access to knowledge agenda and the reform of IP agenda without reflecting about institutions and reforming IP institutions, right? Uh, and, 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 and the way these institutions that produce these norms operate and uh, can have an impact. The second issue is that, that I, I take away is the, the issue of regional level organization, regional uh, governance of IP, right? I think a lot of the mobilization, again, we have seen is at the global level 
or at the national level, right? But it's not easy to intervene at the regional level of governance, uh, again, because it's, far re it's, it's often removed. But you have, at least in Africa, this process of PIPO going on. Uh, in Asia, you have the ASEAN, uh, the ASEAN uh, process on IP that, again, holds, uh, is, is really, if you look at what they're doing, it tends towards to quite a maximalist view of intellectual property. So I think the regional governance of intellectual property is, is an important issue that should be on the radar uh, because uh, uh, there is a lot, of, a lot of movement around it uh, in, in kind of the global governance um, of knowledge. But again, I'm probably maybe a, a ray of hope in trying to be reactive also, but I think to continue to be engaged with an issue that if not had been addressed could have had uh, huge uh, implications. Thank you very much. Thank you.